شاء الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين الحمد لله هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا هدانا الله جزاك الله thank you for very much for obviously the opportunity and the the honor in being here and being um, given the opportunity to be able to speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and on the core topics of purpose and who we are in this world and and exploring those facets inshallah and uh, a great initiative mashallah uh, this is what we need going forward uh, especially in a ever changing rapid uh, rapidly changing world so congratulations to everybody involved and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow this to be to be the norm Khair, inshallah, we'll make a start with Allah Tabarak wa Taala. First, I mean, if we look at the topic, the topic today is about purpose, who we are in this world, what it's all about. That's really what it what it is today. What is it all about? And we want to canvas those topics, inshallah, in in some great detail. And we can't really canvas those details without actually talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost and just about some of the issues in, in a very detailed way because he's the one that started it all. Um, I know that sounds like uh, you know two kids in the principal's office saying he started and he started and whatever the case may be but that's not what that, that means that sentence actually he did start it all. Uh, we did nothing. We couldn't do anything because we were nothing. And he started it all. He's the one that reached out and made the move and did the creating and we were just uh, subject to his power. That's it. So he commenced everything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is it all about? And that's that's really what where we want to start. First and foremost, as we live in this world, even if we have an, an inability to witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't mean his lack of presence. This is a really important statement. Just because we aren't able to testify and see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, experience Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that in the sense that someone would witness to their to their uh, their heart's desire, it doesn't mean Allah's lack of presence. Allah is always there. Allah is closer to us than our jugular vein. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never absent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never removed from the picture. Anything that prevents us from experiencing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our deficiency. But it has no part to do with Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always been there. It's a really important thing to, to mention and go forward. And we've often mentioned in our I've often mentioned in our classes that there are some people who they need some proofs and evidences to witness, Allah, to have firm conviction. For example, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, firm conviction. And you might come up with an argument and you might come up with some type of discussion and then it'll enhance that conviction. Then you need people who are of that category whereby they need to go through a very scientific endeavor. And they need to prove something in a very, very scientific way. And after discovering all these things through many algorithms, they come to the sense of belief in Allah, a very strong belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then there are those people who all they need is a simple reflection. They take a look in the mirror. They look at themselves and they know what it's all about. That category is the best category to be on because at the time of death, all those proofs and evidences will dissolve. And the only thing that will remain is, did you know who you were? That's what will remain. So there are those three types of categories. Now, one type of those, I think the masses are in the category of, you know, it's the proofs and the evidences, which is fine. But you work your way up from there, right? So it's, if you start there, that's fine. But where do you get to? You keep working your way up and your way up and your way up until you come to this realization. And that's what we're talking about. Who you are, who are we? And it's not that we don't know, uh, and this is the point. It's not that we don't know, but we don't have the realization. We don't have the awareness. And that's a significant point that I'm gonna to touch on today. So if you wanna highlight that fundamental point, 
It's not about that we don't know. We have the answers. We know who we are. We know where we came from, why we're here and where we're going. But the realization is another thing altogether. The awareness is another thing altogether. So our entire faith is based on Tawheed. And Allah is one. It's based on unity, divine unity. But the perceptions about Allah are infinite. What people think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are infinite, even though he is one divine being which our religion, it hinges upon. And so our thoughts can't necessarily contain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't contain him. He's not like a butterfly that can be contained in the net of our mind. It's something that his wonder and his awe and, and his beauty and all these things, all these traits about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot contain, and we can't contain them in our mind. Our mind is limited. And sometimes all we have is that silence. Because when you put things to words, you lose those, almost sometimes those infinite possibilities. Whereas the silence sometimes is the only way to encapsulate this, this wonderful awe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes is a silence is all, is all we have. And that's really what the ulama they say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his essence, Allah is a thing. Allah is something. We're going to see him on the day of judgment. But he's not a thing that can be known. He is a thing that we will see and he's a thing that we will fall in love with. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fundamentally, his essence, we can't comprehend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the reality before us, before us and for who we are. The truth is, before we were time, before we existed, Allah knew us. Before we were anything, you were known. And you, that means that you weren't known to anyone except Him. He was the only one that you, knew you before you were a thing. And what that also means is you were the loved one before time. He loved you before time itself. So before the existence of time, He loved you. You hadn't been created yet, but He loved you before time. He loved you before you were a thing, before you were anything. And that's a reality for us. And it's a reality we need to come back to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always contained you in his infinite knowledge before you were even a reference or a thing that could be made reference to. We were always in his knowledge. And he determined that we'd come into this universe at a finite point in time. Now, why is it important that we speak about these things? Because we're getting to the present, inshallah. But I think it's important to know our background. It's important to know our foundation. And our foundation is effectively nothingness. We came from nothingness. We came from non-existence. We weren't a thing, and then we became a thing. And before we became that thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love was attached to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and compassion was encompassing us. This is a reality. We were contained in his knowledge. Always. We've always been in his knowledge. If you weren't born from your mother, it doesn't mean that you would never have come into existence. If your mother and father never got together and married, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't have been created. You would have come here in some, through some other means. You were a soul that was destined to come into this world. You were a soul that was waiting to occupy that womb. And so you were always destined to be here. And so we fast forward to this now, this nothingness that we are, and that we present that in front of Allah. We give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our nothingness, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us his everything. He gives us his eternalness. So imagine it's almost like saying nothingness has a value. It sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? But nothingness is priceless. Because it attracts the infinite. Because that's our foundation. That's, who, that's where we've come from. Non-existence. And yet we present that in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us everything. He gives us Him. He gives us His mercy. He gives us His compassion. He gives us that relationship with Him. And that relationship that we get with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's the eternal. So what is this value that has been attached to my nothingness? And why is it so valuable? Why is it so priceless? What is it all about? That I give you this thing of myself which is finite and it comes from non-existence 
and yet you've given me yourself. It's, it's, it's subhanAllah, it's, it's mind-boggling, it's astonishing. It's outstanding when we think about it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us everything. We ask this question, how could nothingness be so valuable? How could it be? And why is it? And why is that the case? And so this whole notion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his power, and his power, the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only his. There's nothing and no one in existence that possesses any power. All power is his. There's no force outside of his force. There's no dark force that exists somewhere in the cosmos that rivals Allah. There's nothing that exists that rivals him. There's nothing. There's nobody at all. There's only one power, one force, one ability, and that is his. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're limited. Our limit, we're, we are limited. We, we don't possess an independent power free of Allah. Our actions that, that are created, they're created through His power. Our atoms now that we're, we're sitting down and we're listening to this conversation, and at the moment there are trillions and trillions and trillions of atoms all agreeing with one another at the moment to come together to make you, you. And they're all agreeing with one another to be you. And this is through the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not the only one who created you and then you somehow become a dependent being on earth and you walk around like that. No, He sustains you from moment to moment. Let me say that again. From moment to moment you are sustained. If Allah left you for a moment, you would disintegrate and fall into nothingness. Ten years ago, those atoms that you are now were not the same. One year ago, those atoms that you are now were not the same. Six months ago, those atoms that you are now are not the same. Two days ago, those atoms that are now are not the same. Allah recreates from moment to moment. If He left you for a moment, just left you for one moment, you would be nothing again. All power is His. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begin the relationship? Look, Alhamdu. Look how He began the relationship with you. Alhamdulillah. Allah begins the relationship with you by first saying, All praise is mine. Praise me, because it's mine. And you owe me all your praise. I'm, I'm owed. I'm worthy of all that praise. He commenced the relationship like that with us. Surah Al Fatiha. Alhamdulillah. Why is that the case? Why is he worthy? Why is all praise due to him? And when we start to hear what Allah, these things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see then why he commenced the relationship like that. Is there any other worthy than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so, moment to moment preservation, moment to moment sustenance, moment to moment keeping us in existence. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that requires then that if we can't have a tongue that is moment to moment thankful, then we have gratitude of heart. And that gratitude of heart and that state of heart is something that is one of the only things that even in Jannah, it increases, it never stops. So in Jannah, and, and this point is a really critical point that Ghazali makes, rahimahullah. Ghazali says that in Jannah, taqwa is non-existence. Ta taqwa doesn't exist. Why? Taqwa is something that it's a mechanism that stops you from engaging haram and sin you don't need that in jannah so taqwa is gone patience in jannah doesn't exist why because patience is also a mechanism that rivals anger so when you have when you feel the feeling or the emotion of anger patience comes along and puts you in check and you utilize this trait of patient to keep you grounded and people have taken that as second nature, right? But no one can say they don't possess the trait of anger. Anger is a normal sifa. It's a normal trait. The idea is never to remove the sifa of anger. Anger is used for good. Ghazali, he mentions his point about saying, the idea is not to remove anger. The idea is to temper anger. The idea is to guide anger. The idea is to usher it where you want it to be ushered. And you do that through your patience too. But in Jannah, there's no patience because there's no need for it. It's a mechanism. 
Taqwa is a mechanism. All these things that we utilize in this world are mechanisms. But then, shukr is not a mechanism. Shukr is a state. And Ghazali says that in Jannah, it's the state that increases. So it's not something that you utilize to reach an objective, but rather shukr or gratitude is the objective. So a grateful heart is the objective. And Ghazali says, he even mentions this verse, وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ Even in Jannah, based on what they see, they say, in Jannah, الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ they, say, they give this praise to Allah. They have a grateful heart. So it's a state. And those who achieve that state in this world and the hereafter, that is the, in, in the hereafter, it's an increase. But in this world, it's really important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he shows us what, the situation is when he begins the relationship by saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And so, what I want to talk about today, inshaAllah, having mentioned all of these things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and there's so much more. Wallahi, there's so much more. And I'll just, I'll give you this one last thing before we finish our introduction about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I really wanted to do that just today about Allah. Before we started our real conversation, about identity and purpose. Because you can't talk about purpose, and you can't talk about identity, you can't talk about belonging and who we are if we haven't laid the foundation of Allah Azza wa Jal. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world, my dear respected brothers and sisters, He, he, will, break, he will break you. And He'll break you for many reasons. And He doesn't break you to hurt you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't break us to hurt us. Maybe sometimes Allah will break you to break your complacency. Because people can come be, become complacent. So Allah will break them but to break their complacency. You know what broke you? His love broke you. His hub for you broke you. His compassion for you broke you. And it's not because he wanted to break you in the negative sense of the word but rather because he wanted you to see something. And you couldn't see it except from that state. Do you know Abd, a Abd or an Amma? We're all here to talk about identity. We're all here to talk about purpose and who we are. But we can't talk about that if we don't have this realization and we don't have this definition of a servant. Ubudiyah. You know this Ubudiyah notion, this, this belief that we are the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to fulfill that. If we don't understand that in its entirety of ubudiyah, that's where we start to see these problems. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Allah, He breaks. Allah, He presses. Allah, He agitates. He causes agitation to a human being. And what happens in that agitation, a person begins to shift their perspective. They start to see something about themselves. They start to see that I'm not invincible. I have... Du'af, I have weakness, I have deficiencies, I have flaws. But most importantly, I have a need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophets, same way. Total need. Ibrahim alayhi salam. When Ibrahim was cast in the fire, look at that perspective of where he was. Ibrahim alayhi salam was cast into the fire. Ibrahim, when he was sent an angel by the mountains, by the uh, the Mikael, the one in charge of the weather and the rain. Mikael came to Ibrahim and he said, give the command. Give the command, Ya Ibrahim. And what we'll do is we'll extinguish this fire that was so intense through the rain and it'll, it'll be gone. That was so hot and so intense that Ibrahim had to be catapulted in this fire. This is not a fake fire. It's not make-believe. It's a real fire. Ibrahim was in it. It's a literal fire. You imagine the panic that people would go to if they see a fire. The people even didn't approach it when they cast Ibrahim in. They stayed very far from it. They had to create a mechanism to catapult Ibrahim into that fire. And yet when the Malaika comes to Ibrahim, Ibrahim says, La hajat I don't need you. So ubudiyah, when we think about ubudiyah and when we think about servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our destitute state and what that destitute state is about, 
and what it needs. It even goes beyond means and mechanisms sometimes. He said, I don't need you. He said, Then ask him. You ask him. Now you remember before we said about silent, a silent form of communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes all you need is silence. You don't have to use words with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? He is a raqib Allah has placed within us the seed of a salam. He is a salam. He is the peaceful and he is also a raqib He tells you, I'm watching you. I'm the ever gazing. My eyes, my, my sight is always upon you. And that seed is within us. And sometimes we go to somebody and we, you know, we're stressed and somebody says, how are you? And you've got so many words that you can't, you can't convey to that person. You just can't. It, it's just, I've got so much. And sometimes it's a sigh. It's like a breath or a laugh. It's like, if only you knew. Because they can't know. Because you just don't have the words to be able to tell them what's happened to you. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's silence. Silence is the communication. There's no barrier with words with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's a raqib and you know he's a raqib. Silence is, that's it. It's, I know it. You're there. Khalas. I don't have to use words with you. You know what's going on. You see me, you hear me, you know me. That's it. Human beings, look at the relationship. We can't have that type of relationship that we have with Allah. This is a silence. It's a form of my communication with Him. But with human beings, it's, it's different. They can't under, no one can understand you like you know that Allah understands you. And so Ibrahim, he says, I don't need you. He said, then ask him. And then Ibrahim says, I don't have to ask him. His knowledge, his knowledge of me in this situation is in lieu of the question I have to ask. In other words, I don't have to ask him. He knows. Look at his sign. He didn't even ask him. He doesn't have to ask. His relationship, his connection, knowing who he is and his need on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya narukuni bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. Be cool and peaceful on Ibrahim. Not just cool, he would have froze. But be cool and peaceful. And so here Ibrahim, he stayed in the fire for a period, a period of time. And that was a perspective. I think if that was any one of us, you could imagine the shift in our perspective. If, if we were to enjoy that same situation. But this was the Prophet Ibrahim. This is who Ibrahim is. And this happened to many of the prophets and they understood that ubudiyah, they understood that situation. Today, and that brings us to our main point, really the point that we wanted to start on. What is our purpose in this world? What is it all about? What are we doing here? And we know that before we came into this world, before we occupied that womb, before we were even the, the flesh and bones and blood that we are, when we came on earth at one point, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extracted us from the loins of Adam. Adam, alayhi salam, he's looking out to all his progeny on earth. They're all extracted, every one of us. We're on earth and we're all extracted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us our purpose. He tells us what our purpose is. At that point, we come out in little ants, occupy a body, our soul. The scholars, they say, one sheikh, he mentioned, he said, that for the, this soul, it seems to be the case that for your soul to work at the optimum level, it needs to be infused with a body. This is one of the reasons why when you look at the grave, the scholars, they had this discussion about is a person, is, is a person, do they witness in the grave in body and soul or is it just soul? And that's why the body is so important in terms of what we do after death. And even in Jannah, Sorry, in the, here, in the hereafter, we were resurrected through the last pellet bone in our, in our bone, in our vertebrae, or in our bone, uh, in, in our spine. And so we're resurrected from that. We occupy a body once more. And so we utilize faculties. So it's, it makes sense then the hadith says that we came out like little ants, indicating that the soul needs a body to function at its optimum level. And so we came out. And that's an interesting point because the hadith also talks about ants. So it doesn't talk about that we occupied a big physical body like today, but rather we occupied a small body. 
And that also is understandable because you imagine how many billions and billions and billions of people would ever exist on earth that they all were found at the same time. You imagine if they occupied larger bodies, they probably wouldn't be able to fit on this earth, low alam. But as ants, they would be able to fit. That's miniature size. And that's what the hadith indicates. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at that point, at that juncture, and it's inter- such an interesting hadith, it has a lot of tafsir on it. But at that juncture, an Adam alayhi salam is looking at all of us. That's all his progeny. That's everyone that would come to occupy a body in this world. Everyone that is destined, that is a soul that needs a body that would come into this world is before Adam. And the purpose of what we're meant to do is assigned to us. Angels have a different taklif. You know, taklif, their taklif is different. Angels also are responsible, but their responsibility is not like our responsibility. Their responsibility is to execute those roles that have been assigned to them. Ours are different. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your rabb? Qalu bala. The purpose is assigned. The situation then goes back to um, another, another, uh, um, another station where we can't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've heard some very interesting commentary on this situation of, it's called bay'atu last, alastu bi rabbikum, it's called the bay'ah, like when you gave, you pledged, you made an oath and you pledged to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you would take him as your Lord. And that's why I said, alastu bi rabbikum, he didn't say ilah, he said they used the word rabb, alastu bi rabbikum, qalu bala. And does anyone remember that, by the way? Do you remember that? Someone nodded. Who remembers that? Do you re- anyone remember that event? Nobody? Some people said they remember that event. Yeah. It's been written that some people remember that event. SubhanAllah, like you, you read some of the instances in some of the great religious beings in this world. Some people have said they remember that event. Allah knows best, but it's a, it's a, you can imagine the scene, you can imagine uh, Prophet Adam alayhi salam, you can imagine being uh, able to remember the testimony, the testification at that point. Muhammad, we come into this world, we're here now, alhamdulillah, we give shukr and thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we're able to enjoy the existence that Allah, that Ibn Ata'illah, he talks about being one of the greatest blessings, which is existence. And it is a blessing, one of the greatest blessings. And you know, you look at the, you look at the sort of the, the audience here today, and I, I would assume that most of you are university students. Put your hand up for university students, or your student of some sort. Everybody's a student. Okay. Put your hand up if you're actually attending university. <laughs> attending university. Okay. All right. Most of you are attending university. Okay. So I, identity and belonging is huge. It's it's a it's one of those things that. Especially in the current world, a lot of people they have to struggle with. And nowadays, whether it's virtual identity or real identity, who am I in this world? Who am I in this world? And where do I belong to? And who do I belong to? And sometimes those questions go hand in hand about belonging. And that's really the point that we want to talk about. This, do I really understand and am I really aware of that belonging and it is about belonging why is it about belonging because if you realize that you are the possessed servant of Allah so in other words I am totally possessed by him if you realize that then you realize your total need on Allah let me say that again a realization of do I realize and do I have an awareness of who I belong to why do we say inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un? It's about belonging. And belonging is your identity. Belonging is who you are. And people may know the answers to that question if you say, who are you? People might know the answer, but it doesn't mean they necessarily have a realization. Let me give you a real life example. So I had a, I had a situation once where a family came and I was speaking to a young man, a young man. And that young man that I was speaking to, 
his mother was concerned and, you know, he had concerns for this world and there were just questions that they wanted to canvas. And we started to canvas those questions. Like any young man or young woman growing up in this world, we all have questions. And he had questions. We canvassed some of those questions. Very vague story. We went through some of the issues. We got to a point in the end where there was something that in his world that he, you know, he wanted to address. And in the end, he said to me, he said, look, I, I get why I'm here. And his words stuck with me. He said, I get why I'm here. I understand. He said, but I'm not choosing Allah over what I'm going to do. And his words stuck with me. So you can have the knowledge about who you are. You can have the answers to those questions. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the light bulb went off in your soul. It doesn't mean that you had that awareness of who you are. You can know the answers to who you are. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you realize who you are. And you know how before we were talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will agitate a person? Allah will agitate human beings in this world to create that, that awareness. You know, unless we're agitated, we don't know what we're attached to. Once we become agitated and moved and then the shock waves come, it's sort of you, you start to realize these, these are all the things that I was attached to. And that stuck with me with that young man who said, I will choose that over my maker and creator. Despite knowing and despite that young man regurgitating to me about the purposes and why you're here and what you're doing and what it's all about. So it is about belonging. It is about identity, but it's about a realization of identity. And it is about a realization of who you are. And that's why this example that I always give of this great saint called Rabi al adawiya Rabi al adawiya by the way, I'll just tell you a little bit about her. You know her school, her school, this great woman, this great saint, Rabia, not many people know this, but her school, the ones, the people that were responsible for her school was actually indirectly Aisha radiallahu anha. Aisha, see Rabia al adawiya often she's quoted, but often many people don't know where she came from. And many people don't know the tribe and the clan that she came from. She actually came from a very, very spiritual clan, this woman, that indirectly Aisha was responsible for. Aisha radiallahu anha had a maid servant that used to help her. And that maid servant often quoted hadith from Aisha radiallahu anha and she's actually mentioned in the hadith books. And what happened is that woman was directly responsible for the creation or the, 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 the if you like, the building of that school that Rabi al adawiyah came from. Rabi al adawiyah when we talk about belonging, and we talk about servitude and being Allah's servant. Why do we talk about that in purpose at the same time? I'm going to tell you why. But she would say, I didn't worship you for Jannah, Ya Allah. I, I didn't worship you for your heaven. I worshipped you because I'm your servant. That's why. There's ubudiyah. When it comes to servitude, write this down. No strings attached. There are no strings attached. I worship you because that's our relationship. There are no strings attached in terms of in terms of you and I, you put me wherever you like. You put me, you send me off to hellfire, you send me off to Jannah, you put me in wherever you want to put me. But there is no strings attached when it comes to my worship of you. That is who I am. As human beings, we can never ever rise above that. We will never be more, we will never ever rise above that that state of who we are and that relationship that we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will always be his servants. In Jannah, living forever, being caretaken forever, right? That will always be the state. Always. You'll always need his power. You'll always be dependent on him. You'll never be independent from him. That'll always be the case. So Rabi al adawiyah those statements, I worship you for you. If you put me in your hellfire, I'll still always be your, your, your amma. I'll always be your servant. I didn't worship you for Jannah. She understood something about herself, but not only understood, but she realized, I belong to you. I'm yours. You own me and you possess me in the literal word of possession. So Sayyid al-Buti will say, who are we? Who am I? Abdan mamlukan lillah. Abdan mamlukan lillah. 
A ma'abd that is mamluk. What is mamluk? I'm possessed. He owns me. Lillah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's the, it's the awareness of that. Do you, do you realize that? Now, every single one of you, I guarantee you in this room, would nod yes. I agree with you. But have you realized it? And what's the difference between saying yes and what's the difference between realizing that that's the case? Ghazali, rahimahullah, he said, the veil, if you could lift it. See, now, now at the moment we have veils that obviously are before us that we can't see those veils that exist in our life. But Ghazali said, if you could lift the veil, imagine you could lift the veil, you would almost see yourself prostrating to certain objects other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't see that in the now, but what would they be? What would those certain objects be? Those certain objects might be objects in the world. It might be to your own ego. It might be to your own traits of anger. It might be to traits of dunya. It might be to traits of wealth. It might be to traits of... It might be to certain objects like that. Because Ali said you would see the self prostrating before things to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this would be the masses. A lot of people would see this to be the case. But often, and it is the case, we can't see that. So is it the case that, absolutely, we all nod our head, we know who we belong to, but do we have that realization? Why is it so important? So that's, these are some of the things. The what, the who, the when, and the how. The what, we know the purpose. Absolutely, that we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we know that he created us, assigned the purpose. There's no question in that. He assigned that purpose when? Before we came into this world. And how is that purpose executed? Just a point that I want to make, and I think it's really important that we hit on this point. If a, purpose, if a person doesn't realize who they are, you're going to be deficient in executing that purpose. And that's the connection I want to make, inshallah, today. If we don't realize who we are, and we don't have that realization, you're going to fall deficient and be deficient in striking the purpose that Allah gave you. So that means, in other words, if you want to fulfill your purpose in this world, you need to know who you are. And you need to have a realization of that. You need to be aware of that if you want to fulfill your purpose. So if I'm going to achieve in this world, and I'm going to strike those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set for me, I have to absolutely know who I am. And I have to realize who I am. So there was, I had a conversation with one young person, and the young person said to me, said to me that I got, he said, I had a wooded. He said, I had a wooded. And you know what a wooded is? A wooded is daily invocations, it's a connection. Things that you say, remember, reminders, remembers of Allah, remembers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ma'awidat every day, ayat al-kursi every day, and so on and so forth. He said, I had my wooded down pat every day. Wake up, pray my fajr, do my wooded. He said, I remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the whole time. I'm walking, eating, living. Allah is in my heart. I always think about him. And then he said to me, he said, I, I always thought that if I got sick or if a challenge came my way, I would know how to handle it. He said, I, always, he said, I assumed I would figure out how to handle this challenge. Until one day I got sick. But it was what it was. It was how I got sick and the unique nature of the sickness that shocked me. So I'm listening to this story. You can imagine my hair is standing. It's, he's, he's, he's telling me what's going on. And it, subhanAllah, it was, it's a lesson. And he says to me, but how I got sick and the way I got sick, he said, I, I, I couldn't understand he said, every word that I knew, every verse, every dua, every call, every plea, every cry, he said, this was a curveball. He said, I thought I had him figured out. And he hit me with something 
that I never foresaw. I could never see coming. And he said, every day I was in tears and every day I was crying and every day he said, there's one thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did to me. He said, he broke, he broke my complacency. He said, I thought I could handle it. Look, he said, I thought that I could handle it. But I didn't realize something in myself. I said, what's that? He said that I somehow thought I could rely on myself. And he broke that for me. And what he wanted to show me was, you need to have total need of me. Don't look at it in you. You need to have total need of me. So he, he broke me to make me realize something in me that I need to have total need for him. And he said, subhanAllah, he engineered something. He tailor-made something for me. And it was tailor-made. It was engineered. My name was all over it. He used another word. He said, he, he, hit, me, he hit me in a place where I never expected. Couldn't see it coming. He said, and I said, what's your, what's your perspective now? He said, I will never underestimate him again. He said, that's it. I will never underestimate him again. He said, I, ha I, thought, I, could, I thought I could encapsulate him in the net of my brain, but I couldn't. And my perspective is forever shifted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach us about who we are. He will show us something inside of ourselves. So you think you know who you are. And he thought he knew who he was. But look what Allah did. He pressed him. He pushed him. And he let him see something that there was a, a, a micro attachment, a very nuanced attachment. And he let him see it. And in the end, he, what did he do? He nurtured him out of it. And he said to me, I regained full health. Alhamdulillah. But it wasn't until first I saw something. He said, and now my perspective is forever shifted. So Allah Azza wa Jal, that's that story. And we look at it, it's in the prophetic stories. It's in the day-to-day -day stories that we experience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us these emotions to utilize them. And we will navigate through this world, but to come to a realization of who we are. And this is where Amr Abdul Khattab, you know, that introspection, that daily reminding oneself, going through the motions, right? Taking oneself to account, inner reflection, this all amounts to realization of who we are. Look at the world that we live in. Look at the current day. Look at social media. Everyone knows about social media. I think everybody's involved and engaged in, so in social media on some level. Everybody's trying to take a part of you. Everybody's trying to say, you know, I, I'm, as a marriage counsellor, I always hear that the notion, these, I always hear certain things as a marriage counsellor, and it sounds to me sometimes like someone is saying, I will give you my love, but I'm going to trade it for a, your acceptance of my disobedience to Allah. I, I hear that. They don't say that, but I hear it. Every day we trade. Every day we negotiate. We negotiate part of that. Give me something that you, give me something that shouldn't, be traded, trade it, and I'll give you something for it. We do it every day. Young people do it all the time. They want to fit in. They want to belong. They want to belong. They want to belong to a particular group. I see it all the time, particularly at a younger age, even at university and beyond. Give me part of who you are, and I'll give you my friendship. Give me part of that aspect, and I'll give you part of my love or I'll give you part of my acceptance or I'll give you part of my attention or I'll give you part of my... We trade often every single day and there are people that trade in their faith. And this is true. People trade in their faith. And it's based... A lot of it is based on that emotion. A lot of it is based because they lose focus. This world is trying to take us. It's trying to take us in. It won't stop. It's there to... It's designed for that purpose. What did the ulama say? This, the ulama said... You were made for, you. The, the dunya was made for you. This dunya was engineered for you. It was made for you. This whole world, everything in this world was made for you. Engineered, designed exactly for you. But you were not made for this world. So let me repeat that. The world was made for you, but you were not made for this world. You weren't made for this world. You don't exist for this world. You exist 
to be with Allah in the hereafter. But look at what this world is doing to us. Look at the impact. Look at the external forces. The external forces are having a major shift nowadays on who we're becoming. It's having a major shift on our identity. It's having a major shift on our belonging. This is happening in this world, little bit by little bit by little bit. That's what is going on, right? You're talking about, we're talking about everything, right? What are we willing to trade? What are we willing to trade? There's a, there's a story, you know, it's a simple story. I, I tell this story to, to young kids all the time. I know you're not young kids and you're more than that, but you'll get the point, right? So I, I'm driving somewhere and I, I see this, this young school kid uniform on. I, I promise you that day it felt like it was minus three, minus four. It felt like it. And so I, I see this kid uh, driving and he's rolled his pants up all the way to his knees. It's freezing. Like if there was a day that you weren't going to roll your pants up, that would have been that day. But he rolled them up. I know it's such a very simplistic example, but that's a bit of a trade-off. In order to fit in and belong to a certain segment of people, I'll dress a particular way and look a particular way because I want to belong. We do it in such little ways that sometimes you don't realize it. But that is the world that we're currently living at the moment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being removed from everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being taken out of everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being shunned when he's mentioned. The me thought of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned. Look at today's world. Look at where we're going. Look at what it's becoming about. So it's no longer about a purpose. What is a purpose? A purpose is something greater than you. It's something greater than us. When you look at a purpose, a purpose is not about us. It's something greater than us. What is our deen about? Our deen is not about being yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't send you to earth to be yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you to earth to change yourself. Not to be yourself. To change yourself. To be different. And so when we look at identity and we look at who we are and the realization of that, and in this sheet that you have, and we talk about, and my apologies for deviating uh, off script, utterly deviating off script, right? If you look at point eight, that point eight that says achieving purpose without knowing oneself, you can't achieve the, it becomes difficult to achieve the purpose if you don't have a realization. And what I would put there at point eight is a realization. We need an awareness. What are we actually attached to? Who do we belong to? Do we realize that? And what are the experiences that I've had in my life to come to that realization? Have I had any experiences? And what has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala done to me? Not to hurt me, not what he's done to me, but what he, wants to make, what he wants me to see. What does he want me to see in the things that I've experienced? These are the type of questions at point eight that every one of us should be asking. Every single one of us. Because if we can't know and have that realization of who we are, then that becomes a, becomes a very crucial thing later on. And these are the types of questions I would ask there. As for point four, when we look at point four, the village has been eradicated. It's true. And why does that, the reason why I put that before point eight, in point number four, the village has been eradicated. Does anyone know why I would say the village has been eradicated? Jib, uh, Jibran? Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Yep. Um, possibly because we've removed Allah from the equation, uh, and that's basically like eradicated this whole world to live that we live. Exactly. Absolutely. Hamad, you want to say something about the village? Village is traditionally used to be your identity, and your means of support for those who welcomed you. Means of support, definitely, definitely. Did you want to say something? Yeah, it, it leads to into, uh, globalization, perhaps? It leads to? Uh, globalization. Into, uh, so, like, villages um, self-isolated with um, their own chef and all that. Maybe that's what it means? That's a, unique, that's a unique way of looking at it. That's a unique way of looking at it. Which is, they, they're all right. They're all, they're all correct. I thought the unification in this day and age, that people are using less than the provision of the world. So that's why it's like... Lack of institution. Absolutely. Community institution. Community institu absolutely. 
That's why we need Abu Hanifa Institute and Mizan and Mizan. Definitely Mizan. Yes. The, the unique way of looking at it, two unique ways of looking at it, and they're not, there's none that are wrong. You know, there's, there's a saying that it says, you need a bala to rabbi awalad. The village raises your child, the doctor, the shopkeeper, mother, father, brother, neighbor, passerby. It takes a village to raise somebody. It takes a village to have an impact on you. And so, you know, someone said to me the other day, they rang me and they said to me, I'm so sorry, I only ring you when I need you. I said, don't ever apologize for that because actually that's such a beautiful trait. It's beautiful. You know, people look at that like a negative. Don't ever do that. If you ring somebody because you needed them, it's good. No problem. I mean, it's not good. Don't do it because I didn't ring you when I need you. You obviously want to form relationships when you know you're not you don't just want to use people but this is for dini purposes right it was for dini purposes good purposes but it's such a beautiful trait why because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing you to be utilized and when you can be utilized and you can be used you're being used for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just change the perspective on it as in not at all this is beautiful allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed this connection allah will put somebody in your life that person's apologizing, saying, I'm sorry, but don't apologize. Allah's put you there. It's good. It's fantastic. And so, see that interaction? That's like a village. I'm a passerby. People you can call on. That's like a village. Who are those people in your life? The village is crumbling. The village sometimes doesn't even exist anymore. Why? Because now, wherever you go, whoever you go to, wherever, it's just the things have changed. And they're changing rapidly. That's why we need things like we need we need places like this. We need gatherings like this. We need engagements as such. And so the village has been eradicated. When we talk about the village, it's like it doesn't exist anymore. And there's a lot more that I could talk about that, but I just I'll be brief in that, inshallah. But number five, when we look at point number five, how has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped us? So do we have pens with us? If I could just engage you just for a little bit, that I don't know if, if you all have pens, but if you don't have pens, just utilize your phones. I, I, don't, I don't mind. But if you have your pens with you, how has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped us? Given just a little bit about what we've heard today, and so let's try and keep a little bit contextual, but even you can veer off script. How has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped me? And I really wanted to engage you in this conversation and draw you into this conversation today, inshallah. But I, I'd like to get your points on that. I'd like to sort of hear from you. So when you write it down, I'd also like to hear from you, to be honest. And so we could engage in a little bit of a conversation like that. How has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped you? I know it's, it sounds like such a simplistic question, but I think it's an important one nonetheless. How has He helped us? Can we take like a few minutes just to sort of go through that, inshallah, think about a few things. How has He helped us? How was He shaken us, what has he done for us, what does he do for us? Can you be specific? I'm only joking. I'm only joking. All right. I, I want to mention, I want to talk about that point. And that, that's, a, that's a fantastic point. And this is a point I want to mention, right? A young, a young lady... This is a, a, a story that was told by Saeed, Sheikh Saeed Ramadan al-Buti, rahimahullah. He said, he mentioned the story, he recounted the story in his book, and he said, there was once a young girl who, she used to serve the household. And she, she was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the middle of the night. The Lord of the house, he got up, and he found this young girl worshipping in the corner of the room. And this touches exactly to the point of what we're talking about today. And he heard her saying, Oh Allah, I ask you by your love that you have for me to help me, assist me and guide me and so on and so forth. And then he said, Hajib, this need that, this type of... So he waited until the young girl finished her salam and then he said 
He said, what is this beseeching and this begging of Allah? You're saying, oh Allah, I ask you about, I ask you through your love that you have for me. He said, rather say, oh Allah, I ask you by the love that I have for you to guide me and show me and so on and so forth. And then she said, oh my master, if it were not for his love, and she began to say that it is only through his love that I am able to remember him, only through his love that I'm able to beseech him, and only through his love that I'm able to remember him. And that comes only out of his love. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَ I love them and they love me. And he began with himself first. So what Sayyid Ramadan al-Buti, rahimahullah, he says, he says, I need to be thankful to Allah that when I thank him, I have to thank him for being able to thank him. So the ability that he has endowed in every one of us, we have to thank him for that. To thank him for the ability and capability to be able to thank him. So you and every one of us, you went through a traumatic experience. But you now, we're sitting here and we're thanking him. Ya Allah, thank you for allowing me to thank you. Thank, I, I, I praise you, Ya Allah, for allowing me to praise you. You know, I run, I run this lesson for, for other, other, another group. We talk about how Allah has helped us. And we, we, go into this, um, we go into these other areas. And the other areas that we go into, we talk about, we'll have a break in a moment. I know it's 10.51. We've been going now for quite some time. But just I'll finish on this point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala infused in each and every one of us uh, a capability of loving and of love. And he infused it in each and every one of us. How could we all have a personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we don't have a unique capacity and capability of love? So he infused that in each and every one of us. And so what Sayyid al-Buti is saying is the capabilities that Allah gave you, the mechanisms that Allah gave you, the ability to thank Him, the ability to think about Him, the ability uh, to have those cognitions and to love Him, these are things that we need to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's helped us to, to, to affect and fulfill our ibadah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded prayer. Ya Allah, how can I pray if you don't help me? So Allah helped us. How did He help us? He gave us physical limbs. Ya Allah, I can't make, you commanded me to make wudu. I can't make wudu without the means. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created water and He gave us water. He gave us our physical bodies to undertake the worship that He commanded. And then He provided the water for the wudu that is a condition of prayer. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded and the Prophet ﷺ commanded that we think about we think about him, Allah, and the Prophet Muhammad. ﷺ. Ya Allah, how can I think about you if you don't give me the capacity? So Allah gave us the capacity. Does anyone have the mystery, the answers to the mystery of the soul? Or to the things that we we, we don't know about the ruh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us these these secrets. Not these secrets, but He gave us these things that we can't explain, but we know we have the faculty of the faculty of love, the faculty of thought, the faculty of contemplation, and the faculty to be able to ponder and reflect upon. That's what we do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In our salat, we go into this thinking mode, this pondering mode. We finish our salat, we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're, we're looking at, at a wonderful um, outlay of the land. You know, for us, if anybody, anybody goes to the Blue Mountains, silence. You just think you're contemplating who? The cosmic architect. You're thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have these faculties. How has Allah helped us? If it weren't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we couldn't undertake any form of ritual worship. We couldn't undertake any form of spiritual worship. We couldn't undertake any form of silent worship. Alhamdulillah for being equipped. And He's equipped us with the mechanisms and tools needed to be able to execute our faith and our connection with him. So that's what I would write, what one of the points that I would write, that he's equipped us what we need to connect with him. We need that to connect with him. So he has allowed us with the fact with those imbued us with the faculties to be able to enjoy that relationship with him. Thank you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for giving me these things that allow me to connect with you. Remember, I asked you a question at the beginning. What was the question? Why is nothingness so valuable? 
Why is nothingness so You come from nothing. You came from, why is it so valuable? Well, now we know why. The heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this ruh, which only he has the answers to that we have inside ourselves, the hearts that we have are able to connect with him. And we now see the value. Why is it valuable? Because it connects with the one who possesses all things. So your essence and your background might have been nothing non-existence, but you're valuable because you can connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you and he loves us. All right. There is a point to mention as well uh, about the aspect of, of love. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Think a break, inshallah. So let's have a break, inshallah. We'll come back after the break. If you have any questions, write some of those questions down. I'm more than happy to engage. And we can, I think, after have a bit more engagement. If you'd like to ask, I'm more than happy to take some questions. I do have one other important segment I want to run through. But inshallah, after the break, we'll the da'wan. And alhamdulillah, let's have a little break, inshallah. Most occasions, and I, especially around this occasion, uh, I think it's more pertinent that I do say it. Do you remember we were talking about human beings and ourselves when when we didn't exist? So you were not a thing. The space itself, the cosmos itself, didn't exist. This cosmos, as we know it, is space. But space is a created entity, and that spe- that created entity didn't exist. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. One thing that we know is that he doesn't create for need and he doesn't create in vain. So what does that mean? He doesn't create in need and he doesn't create in vain. So he doesn't create because he needs you and he doesn't create because it's a waste. You know, when you do something that in vain, it means I do something, but it has no purpose. It's just I do it because it's a sport. It's like a play. It's almost like a, almost like a form of gaming or entertainment. Allah doesn't do anything like that for that. So this concept, Allah... He doesn't create for, uh, for need and he doesn't create in vain. Then why do we exist? When we talk about purpose, it's important to know this response. Why are we here then if he doesn't create for need and he doesn't create in vain? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do you think that you were just created like for fun or for a sport or out of play, and that you would not come back to us? Allah, it's a rhetorical question. Allah says, is that what you think? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, one of his names is Al-Ghani. He doesn't need or has need of any of his creation. So why are you here? Now a person will say, I am here to worship Allah. I am here to worship Allah. I had an atheist who sat with me and when we were sitting at the table, someone said, one of the, one of the Muslims were there, was said, God created us to worship him. Okay, he, we know that. We know that that's 100% as well. I said, we understand that. But then there's a why to that. There's also a why. That, that's for us, that purpose in terms of what we do. But there's also a why that comes from that. We're not questioning at all. We're just un, trying to un, seek to understand, is there a further why? And there is. And as we said, and I'll say this one last time, he doesn't create for need. He doesn't need us. And he doesn't create in vain. Then why do we exist? Because he doesn't need our worship. So why are you and I sitting here talking about Allah and we're, we're talking about connecting with him, but he has absolute no need for us? Do you know what that means? That means that he could tomorrow turn us into nothingness and it wouldn't phase him. So why do we sit here and enjoy that relationship with him? What is it about that he gains nothing from it? And as I sat there and I started to tell this atheist, to explaining the very reason as to why, I said to him, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, and he, he, he called himself something. He gave himself a name. And before I tell you what that name is, I'm going to tell you something else about created beings. Every object in this universe was given a name. It was given a name except Allah. No one gave him his names. He gave himself his names. 
So everything, when, when Adam was created, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam the names of everything. Because who gave them the names? Allah. But who gave Allah his names? Nobody. He gave himself the names. Ajib. He is unique in that too. In everything. So then why am I here? Allah named himself Al-Wadud. Al-Wadud is not the loving. I don't like the translation loving. Rather, Al-Wadud is the affectionate. And the affectionate is, is when, you, when you do something based on the emotion that you feel. So it's like saying, I love my wife, I love my children, but that's just simply saying how I feel. But wadud or wood is to do something about it. So when Allah says about a husband and wife, when they first get married, what not only when they first get married, obviously in the marriage, we obviously want this to always be there. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً Allah he says, he infused between the couple mawadda. What is mawadda? Mawadda is now affection. So it doesn't just mean you get married and say to your wife, I love you, and she says, I love you back. No, it's about now actualizing in practice that you now act and that you gift and you show and you do and you care. So care is love. Care is a form of love. Gifts are a form of love. All these things are a form of love. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً And Allah سَمَّحُولُ What? Allah, he, he uh, named himself Al-Wadud. So uh, Sayyid, sorry, Ibn Ata'illah, he talks about existence as being one of the greatest blessings. So existence is a manifestation of Al-Wadud, right? Wood. It, this is now an expression of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wood, which is uh, the affectionate and the loving. So, Allah created us out of who He is. That's who He is. Not based on need, not based on want, not based on vain or sport or play. But rather, this is what defines Him. This is His trait, Al-Wadud. He creates out of love because that's who He is. Not because He has to and not because it's convenient and not because it's in vain. But rather, that's who He is. So he says, I love them and they love me. So he, when we talk about love, we, we, we actually talk about this entanglement in divine love. We're, we're entangled in it, right? Write that down. We're entangled. Wallah, we're entangled in divine love. You can't break free from it. That's the reality. That you were created and born out of it. Allah favored you. And so why do we exist? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored me and loved me. That's why. Now look at now what does he want? So Allah wants something from me. What does he want? What does he want? What is it about? What's the purpose? Tell me. This is the purpose. Okay. He created me out of his love. What do you seek from me? Just ibadah? What is, what is, okay, in the ibadah, what am I finding? Okay. Good question. So Allah, look what he did. Azza wa Jal. Gave you your emotions. Gave you your feelings. Gave you your desires. Gave you all the things that he gave you. What does he want now? And he hid it, and he made himself hidden. You can't see him with your physical naked eyes. What does he want from me? What does he seek of me? What does he want me to have? What does he want me to do? Okay. He wants you to make a choice of your own volition. Optional choice. A free choice. Not a forced one. A free choice to choose Allah over your desires and over all of the obstacles and he wants you to choose to love him back that's what he wants from you and that is reflected in ibadah so yes we created jinn human beings illa liabudun, but that is actually reflecting what reciprocity what's reciprocity i'm reciprocating the reason why you created me i'm reciprocating that back i'm choosing to love optionally, voluntarily choosing you over everything else and putting that all aside. So when you engage in your salat, who are you choosing? You're saying, Ya Allah, I'm choosing you over everything. When you engage in amal salih, Ya Allah, I'm choosing you over everything. When you engage in dhikr, Ya Allah, I'm choosing you over me, over myself. What do you mean choosing you over myself? Okay. 
What does that mean? I'm choosing you over me. When Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he came to the Prophet he said, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than everything except myself. He said, Ya Umar, your faith will not be complete until you love me more than you. In other words, out of everything you love, I should be more loved than you. So you love all these things, I'm at the top of your love list. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ the ones who love, the ones who are believers, their love for Allah is the most dominant of all the things that they love. In other words, you can love many halal things on earth, halal things, not haram things, halal things. But out of all the halal things that you love, the love of Allah has to be most dominant. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ they love, their, their love for Allah is dominant. So I can love many things in my world, but the love that I have for Allah reigns supreme. What does Allah want from us? He wants to reciprocate. He wants us to reciprocate back this love. And He wants us to make that manifest and fulfill that through our ibadah, which we do. But do you realize what you're doing each and every single time? Ya Allah, I'm reciprocating the very reason why you created me. Ya Allah, I'm reciprocating the very point of which I'm here. The very purpose, when you talk about purpose, purpose, just look why he created you. Just look the fadl. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, min fadlillahi alayka khalaqaka. From the favor of, that Allah did for you, he created you. Reciprocate. When you reciprocate, when we talk about fulfilling purpose, fulfilling purpose, reciprocity. Contribution, right? Contribution to this relationship. How do you contribute to this relationship? So you give that through the ibadah, inshaAllah. So, so important, such a, a beautiful way of looking at it. And that, I, I often say, is the greatest love story. That is the greatest love story. So entangled in divine love. It's the reality. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us out of that. So it begins with the divine being. If you look at point one on that sheet that you have, it begins with the divine being. Right? He started it all. Absolutely he started it all. And he started it all how? Through his divine love, through his being Al-Wadud. And he named himself Al-Wadud. Now we come into this world and Allah named himself what? Al-Hadi. Who is Al-Hadi? What does Hadi mean? How is Al-Hadi manifest in our world? What is it, what, who is Al-Hadi? Do you think that you come into this world and that Allah guided you once and we say, Khalas, I'm guided and that's it? Wallah, yesterday, just yesterday I was speaking about this concept and I was saying to somebody, I can be sincere, but I can have misguided sincerity. Someone who doesn't believe in Allah can be sincere, but not be guided. Someone who can be a believer can have sincerity, but not have guidance. Who, what is Hidayah? And who is Al-Hadi? And how does it come into our world? Don't just think because you have sincerity, you have the relationship or you have the the absolute uh, uh, answers and key to all things. You don't. You have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah mahdina wa hadibina wa ja'alna sababa liman hitada. Make the dua, ya Allah, guide us. Surah al-Fatiha is a, is a summary of the entire Quran. And Surah al-Fatiha ends with ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. The entire Quran can be summarized as to what? Giving hidayah to human beings. Connecting the abd with Allah. It lists six, type, six objectives of the Quran. One of those objectives is guidance. Because it ends your fatiha. And the fatiha is a summary of the entire Quran. Hidayah. Who is Allah hidayah? What is hidayah? You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just guides once and that's it? You say someone's guided and that's it? Khalas? That's not just what guidance is. Guidance is guidance along the journey, every step along the journey. And it could be in anything. It could be anything, it could be in everything. Allah, that's why every day, Allah mahdina, wahdi bina, waj'alna sababan liman Allah guide us and guide through us and allow us to be a means of guidance for others every day. Allah may guide us and guide through us. Allah mahdina. And when you read Surah Al-Fatiha every day in your salat, ihdina. When you read ihdina today, make it, Give it meaning, give it thought, give it impact, give it that spiritual component it deserves. Ihdina ya Allah. Without your hidayah, I'm lost. Wallahi, that's the reality. 
without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hidayah. We're lost. Who led you to come here today? Do you think that it was a thought bubble that switched on that brought you here? This is hidayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought you here. Wallah, you'll experience that. Wallah, experiencing things on a level you'll come to see. Little things. Allah will guide you to little things. Make you in certain places, put you with certain people, make people cross you a certain way. You'll come across people say, why am I here? Why, how did I get here? How Allah leads you to certain things. Right? Allah guides along the journey. Not just the guider who's once right in your life, but no, the one who guides all the time. Allah is Al-Hadi. Al-Hadi who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I, I could be somewhere and I'm out to engage a particular situation and I get a phone call and then I turn back from wherever I was going. I, I just get a phone call and it stops me and then maybe later on I realize that there was trouble in that place. And that's what happened with me, for example. Right? I get a phone call right before I enter these premises, right? It was like a coffee place. I turn back and I leave and I go to somewhere else and I have coffee and only to realize later there was a massive uproar, a brawl in that. Allah guided me away from it. Little things in life, very little things. Allah will guide you away from. Allah will steer you here, steer you there. You might find yourself there. You might find yourself there. You might find yourself in a meeting one day saying, why am I even here? And then all of a sudden someone comes sits next to you and says, look, I'm really struggling. I need help. And you think, subhanAllah, Allah wanted me right there just to help that person. And then you can see, Ya Allah, use me. They came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, istamilni Ya Rasulullah. Use me, Ya Rasulullah. And we talk about volunteering. People just look at volunteering like volunteering. No, I say always, volunteering, be the first day, the last to leave. And don't expect anyone to pat you on the back. Because why? You're there. Allah wants you there. You're helping. Ask Allah, Ya Allah, use me. And what did the Prophet say? Innaha amana. And the Prophet said to the companion, he said, Istamini, use me, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet said, it's a amana. Today we want people, pat me on the back, give me shukr, thank me and praise me. But it's a amana. All right, we understand. If, if you do not thank the people, you haven't thanked Allah. We understand that. But you, as a human being, and your spiritual growth from that aspect, what are you, what are you doing it for? Why are you helping? Why are you there? What's it about? It's amana. And the Prophet said, he called it khizyatu wa nadama. And day of judgment, it becomes like what? It becomes a source of regret because people accept those who fulfilled it and gave it its right. It's amana. This is amana that we have. Everything, this responsibility, this being guided, this ability to be in. If I find myself in a place, I, I find myself giving that advice. I was somewhere, I mentioned this story the other day. Someone came and said to me, young kid, and he said to me, um, you know, words, very powerful words. He said to me, uh, Allah made a mistake with me. And I, and I looked at him, and subhanAllah, it, it strikes the heart when somebody says that. And I said, there are no accidents with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He makes no mistakes. And then that was the beginning of our conversation. People struggle, and Allah puts you in places. Maybe Allah will put you somewhere for 10 years. And then it happened that someone was watching you the whole time only to come and say at the end, you know, I've been watching you for all this time and, you know, this really resonated or didn't resonate. Hidayah. Allah is al-hadi. So look, who is Allah? When you talk about purpose in life, start with that. It begins with the divine being. Who is He? Who is He? That's where you start. When you know Him, you can focus your purpose. And then, when he, and then he, this being... He guides you on your path to know yourself. So you're better able to connect with Him. How has Allah helped us? How has Allah helped? He didn't need to. He didn't need to help us. He didn't need to help any one of us. But that's who He is. That's who you are. That's who you are. You're not bound. No one can coerce Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did it out of His generosity and favor. No one. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. But that's from his fadl, that's from his generosity. No one can coerce him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we talk about purpose, he, 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 we're born out of that, we come into this world, he guides us upon our pathway. And we're being guided upon this pathway. Guided, 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 and guided to love him. And guided to meet things the right way and hit those targets, inshallah, as we should. And he, he makes us realize things about ourselves. 
And this is very important that we look at in that regard. So it begins with knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we don't, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fa'lam, and know, fa'lam, annahu la ilaha illa, and know that there is no ilaha illallah. Fa'lam, it starts with knowledge. Join a class. Get, sit at the feet of somebody who knows and take knowledge from them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Get to know who he is. It starts with him. It's all about him. The purpose is all about him. And that's where it begins. And so what is Jannah? Jannah is continuity of what? A relationship. Jannah is not just, I'm in Jannah, I'm here, I enjoy all my desires that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me forever, eternity, and that's it. Jannah is a relationship. It's continuity. Jannah is continuity. Jannah is you and I. We still got a special thing. That's what it is. That's why Imam Malik said, if I knew I was going to Jannah, not say Allah, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. Because the greatest na'im in Jannah is saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, wallah, we start to get this sense of the picture that now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, that's who he is. This is, and then he's taking care of me and he's, he's guided me throughout the way. I was reading this, I was reading, going over the story of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam from the moment he was born till the moment that he, he passed. And you look at his life, you know, before he's born, his father passes, six, his mother passes, eight, his grandfather passes, and he's a little boy, and he's with, Abu, he's with Abu Talib, he's going to Sham, and he's a young boy at the time. Uh, the monk, Bahira, he sees him, and he notices something about the Prophet, he's only a little boy. I, I, I've read this story a million times, but yesterday I thought about it in a, such a different way, because I was thinking about, imagine being Bahira, Imagine, because you know what Bahira did? Bahira, normally, what he does, he, when they used to go and visit him in the sham, he wouldn't feed the people, the visitors, he wouldn't feed them. On this occasion, when he saw Muhammad, وسلم, he prepared a meal for them. He prepared a big meal, because he saw this boy, who's his boy? He noticed the, the cloud, he noticed certain things happening, he noticed the salutes of the trees, and he said, and Bahira was, He'd been informed through previous scriptures about who this boy was, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so then he arranged it. They said, Bahira, we never known you to organize this big uh, feast for us. He goes, nah, this is special today. And then what they did, they left the Prophet sallallahu over by the tree next to the luggage to take care of all the luggage because he was a boy. He wasn't with the men. So they left him by his side. When Bahira now, every, all of the men, they're coming, they're eating. And he says, where is that boy? They said, he's over there by the luggage. They brought him over. And Bahira, the, the, the narrations, they talk about Bahira looking at the Prophet and I'm like, like inspecting him. And I, what, what a person would think to be in Bahira's position, inspecting the Prophet before he knew his own mission. And Bahira, he knows that this man is destined for, this boy is destined for greatness. And he's inspecting them up and down. Up and down, and then he sees the, the he sees the seal of prophethood on the prophet's back. Imagine what is going through the thoughts of Bahira. I would love, but we can't. Khalas. Allah didn't destine it for me. But just thinking about what he's going through, looking at that young boy at that time, inspecting him up and down, something that he doesn't even know about his own self, and looking, and he says, "You better get out of here. You better go, because." If they find out about him, they're going to want to kill him. Take him. Take him and leave. Abu Talib got worried. They got stressed. And they straight away, they grabbed, they grabbed the prophet and they took off. That was 12 years old. He's 12 years old at the time. You know who he was with at the time, by the way? You know who was on that trip? Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was with. Not many people know that. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was the prophet's friend in childhood. Not many people know that, but he was there on that trip. <laughs> Subhanallah, it's like destiny. So when Abu Bakr is saying sadaqt, sadaqt, sad, why is he saying sadaqt? He knows him since he was a boy. They grew up together. He knew him. Where's this hidayah come from? It's seen, it's, in, it's, ex, it's, 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 it's manifest and manifested and people are seeing it and it's happening in front of them. And to be inspecting that little boy looking up and down at him, Subhanallah, like, it really it raises your hairs but this is the hidayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you look at the prophet's father and his grandfather Abdul Muttalib 
You know who they were in Mecca at the time? They were very influential people. All of the pilgrims that came, they would look after them. Look at the design of Allah to remove these people from the Prophet's life before he was even born. Why? So nobody would ever say that they had influence on him in his message. And all of the influential people are removed from his world's families. Hidayah of Allah. Who is Al-Hadi? Who is the Hadi? Who is Al-Wadud? Who is Al-Raqib? Al-Raqib, right? Al-Raqib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These names that you've heard today, embody them, internalize them, live them, experience them. I teach, and, and the people who've been here for the classes on Tuesday night, I teach them one thing. You can know about Allah, but experiencing Allah in everyday life is different. You can learn all the Aqidah books there are to read. You can read about them. You can learn about them. You can sit with every Shaykh under the sun. But experiencing that relationship with Allah and putting those details that you know into practice, this is what no one can teach you. This is what no one could teach a Ghazali. This is what nobody could come and communicate with Ghazali. Rahimahullah. He destroyed and deconstructed every knowledge. But when it came to this, he said, I had no language by which I could deconstruct it. It was something that surpassed that. It was something that transcended that. This is Imam Ghazali. So we have those experiences with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to utilize that utterly and absolutely. So these, when we talk about purpose, as you see in, in point one, it talks about the divine being and it started with him. Some of the traits and what I would put there is as well, some of the names. Write some of the names. Al-Wadud, Al-Raqib, right? Al-Rahman, Al-Hadi, who is Allah. Ya Allah, guide me. Guide me along my way. Little things. You're going to buy a car. Ya Allah, guide me. Right? I remember still, I went to put my son in a particular school. I won't say what school it was. And as I was, as I was entering that school, Wallah, true story. I entered the doors of that school. And I said, Ya Allah, if this is not the school for my son, show me, Ya Allah. Guide me away from it. As I entered, Wallah, a woman I'd never seen before, ever. Never laid eyes, ever seen her cross paths with her. She looked at me. She goes, can I talk to you outside? I said, sure. Walked outside. She goes, are you thinking of putting your son in this school? It was a boys' school. I said, yes. She goes, don't even think about it. I said, ya Allah. All right. <laughs> Walked straight back to my car. That was it. Straight back to my car. Allahu al-Hadi. He let... He gave me hidayah away from it. And that's what I wanted. I was absolutely resigned to put him there. And he led me away from it. Why? It's up to him. But that was, if you can't read that sign, then I don't know, there's something wrong with us. But if, if I couldn't read that, but I took it. Uh, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hadi. He guides you along the pathway in everything that you do, in your work, in your marriage, when it comes to children. But we have our way. We have the exemplar in Rasulullah sallallahu so we don't say it's about something that is halal and permissible and good to do. You, that's already set, right? The sunnah is set. How do you fulfill your purpose? With the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad So that's already set, inshallah. All right. So the, and the point two we've taken, right, about being al-wadud. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserving of praise? Why does he deserve it? Just look at the things that he's assisted and helped us with. I'm going to go through these one by one and then I'm going to get to a point, inshallah. The village has eradicated. We've done that. How has Allah helped us? We've done that. We've gone over that. The difference between knowing the purpose and realization of the purpose. We've covered that too. The difference between knowing and realization. Experiencing. An awareness. You know what we can do there too? Every day. Set some time aside. A couple minutes a day. Who am I in this world? What are my attachments? Ya Allah, show me what I'm attached to that I don't even realize. Allah will show you what you're attached to that you don't even know you're attached to. Ya Allah, show me what I'm attached to. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that guidance in that regard. The purpose and the realization. Realization. Knowing who you are and the search. What I would put there at point number seven is belonging. Who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? Are you aware of who you belong to? Allah subhanahu says, if my servant asks you about me, I am near. If my, my servant so وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي My Abd. So being Allah's Abd means something. Being Allah's servant has weight. But you have to be His servant. Not anyone else's servant. Whose servant? Allah's servant. 
So we can't have little things on, on the inside that we serve that we don't know about. Because we might not be aware of them, but sometimes they're there. We have to look deep in ourselves sometimes. And what that means is put yourself in positions like this. Be constant, be consistent. Allah will show you. And you'll get there. You'll refine yourself, but you'll get there. You start a path little bit by little bit. Be consistent. Don't go all out. Be consistent. Little things, but we'll get you there. But who am I? I belong to him. Am I really, really living that? Not just am I aware of that. Am I li Sorry, am I aware of that, but living that? You need to be living that. Who do I belong to? I'm his. I'm totally owned by him. Use me as you like. You know, I understand now, my Mashiach, and it's actually written in books a lot by a lot of Mashiach as well. My Mashiach would say, when people come and they used to ask us a question, we never used to look at the person. We only used to see Allah. Because Allah sent them. And they would think that they're seeing a being in front of them, which was true in reality. But that is just Allah. Why? Because Allah wants me there. They, they see it in a different perspective, like I'm his. He, he, he pulls the strings. Sure, we have choices, but he pulls the strings. I'm his. I'm owned by him. I'm, I'm subjected to what he determines. And that doesn't mean you don't have choice. We're not talking about that. We know we have choice in our limited space. That is absolutely the case. But fundamentally, we absolutely know that we belong to him. That is, that is the reality. So who am I in this world? I belong to him. I am possessed by him. He owns me. He owns my wealth. He owns who I am. He owns my soul. He owns my body. He owns everything about me. And that's the reality of who I am. That's who I am. See, people ask all the time. They say, I'm searching for who I am. People say that. You hear that all the time. I'm, I want to know who I am. That's who you are. Don't ever ask who you are again. That's who you are. The question is, have you realized that? People haven't realized that, and that's what they're searching for. Do you know your fitrah? People talk about the fitrah. Your fitrah. Do you know when Allah subhanahu wa says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your fitrah? Your fitrah, your purity, right? It cannot ever be eradicated. It can't be corrupted either. Ever. It's pure. It's a gift. It can't be extinguished. I would write at point seven my fitrah as well. Why? Because your fitrah can never, ever, ever be removed from who you are. It's who you are. But external forces, they cloud it and they obscure it from being able to have its correct perspective. So a prophet comes to remove that cloud and that veil so you can see Allah through what you've always had. Prophets don't come to prove that God exists. If you ask them, they would say Allah. Prophets don't come to prove God exists. Prophets come to, for what reason? They come to remove the veil. So you're able to see Allah through what you've always had, the fitrah. That's why every person is born as a believer because it's natural to believe. So when the fitrah is pure and you can see clearly through the fitrah, you come to see things for what they are. So people say, I want to know who I am. You're only asking that question because your fitrah is clouded. Because your fitrah is clouded. So when we talk about the difference between knowing and realizing, that's the difference because the fitrah is clouded. And so people are saying, I'm in search. What are you in search of? You know who you are. We look in the lillah. I belong to him. I'm his. You know who you are. But your fitrah has been obscured. So therefore, people are in this search of belonging. Who am I in this world? What is it all about? Maybe you haven't found a function. And maybe you haven't engaged in a responsibility or a type of mentoring role or a type of volunteering role. But that's always there for an offer. That's always there for you to do. Ask Allah subhanahu wa to put you there. So that fitra aspect, right? That fitra aspect and the fitra being clouded is the reason why. It's really important. It's coming back to purifying that. It's a gift that Allah gave us. We ask her, why, why is he worthy of all praise? Look at what he's gave us. Look what he's given us. Look what he gave us and look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done for us. Achieving purpose without knowing. Say, can a person achieve their purpose without knowing oneself? That answers that obviously after coming to point eight, we know that now. It becomes very hard to do that. 
And then it brings us to the last page. If you turn over, what are you unable to gain freedom from? We don't have to do that as an exercise, but what is at your core? I mean, I paint that as a little picture there. I understand, you know, we look at that. You know, some people, power, money, love of world, fame, friends, Facebook, looking good, laziness, their phone, education, watch. What is at your core? What, what gets you? What is it? And it's different things for everybody. For some, you know, some people will look at gaming and they'll laugh. But, you know, I've come across people who say, look, I have, I have an addiction. I'm, a, I'm 11 hours. I'm a gamer. We're not talking 15-year-olds. We're talking 30-year-olds. Right? You know, everything, fame, power, money, all the key concepts. What is at your core? What are you attached to that you can't break free from? Do you belong to them? What is it about? Is that your purpose? Is that your objective? So when we talk about what is at our core, it's, that, that is only meant, it's designed to be a way of questioning ourselves. That's all, right? I wasn't going to make you do it as an exercise. There is an exercise for it where we have it blank and then we make people feel out, well, what is at their core? But that's, you know, you're all adults in this room and but that's just designed to say what is at our core and we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the furthest distant distance from what is at the core and that's by design just for people to reflect upon it it wasn't meant to do uh, to be anything other than for people to reflect it's really important to go back and do that all right any questions that we have because we are running out of time it's 11 54 and I still wanted to do that section that I wanted to go through um but I'll take a few questions I'll think yeah So you can have sincerity with, absolutely without hidayah. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ As a reward for staying patient, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they, are, they have, they're muhtad, they're rightly guided. So right guidance is different to ikhlas. A person can have sincerity um, but not necessarily be guided. I, I, a young man that I was speaking to yesterday um, He's a young man that I, I'm, I'm mentoring in a particular space. And he's a young man who says, I want to be a defender of Islam. I said, good. So learn your fiqh. Learn your fiqh. Don't just say, don't beat your chest and pump your chest and, and take a hadith and say, that's the hadith and I'm going to put this across people's throats and that's how it's going to work. It doesn't work that way. You need to be guided. You need to understand that hadith is a science and without the correct guidance, you misapply what the hadith stands for. And so, how do we apply that? But it does start with sincerity. That is absolutely key. We're not taking that away from the equation. But this is where we say is, ask those who know if you, who, if you don't. If you don't know something, ask those who know. You need a teacher. You need a mentor. And now more and more, we're seeing also a lot in terms of uh, women mashayikh coming and, 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 and leading the way in that regard. Uh, Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman has been in the, in the, in the in the in this space for many 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 years, we have also the likes of uh, Dalia Ayub, who's also many a lot of sisters now, uh, and that's fantastic and it's good for for our community, because we we absolutely need a broad range of people who can affect other people. So ask those who know if you don't know, um, and and that's that's a key of how you bring that in your world. And nothing other than you be a seeker, that's why you be a seeker of knowledge. Yes. Too much questions? Doubt, doubt is good. Doubt is good because doubt is agitation. And wherever there's agitation, agitation only leads to what? Agitation leads, leads you to out of being out of your comfort zone. Right? Agitation leads to good because you're, you know, does anyone wake up for Fajr, you know, especially a young 14, 15 year old, Ya Habibi, Ya Aini, get up to Fajr? That's why did the Prophet say implement water? All right? Or we, you know, the, the spray or, you know, you can just put the finger in the ears and like, agitate them until they eventually get up. My daughter knows my daughter's there, so she'll tell you all about it. But anyway, the agitation causes, it, it creates waves. So sometimes being agitated and look, you ask the questions that you need to know for what the th for the things that you need to, when it's when it comes to fiqh. 
sometimes things lead you into doubt. That means that you, you, you need to keep probing until you remove those doubts. It depends what the doubts are. It depends what the doubts are. It depends what the situation is. But generally, if you have those doubts, ask. But sometimes doubt, you're agitated and it leads you to a place where you, you, you're standing on firm ground. They came to the Prophet and they said, Ya Rasulullah, we get these thoughts. They had these thoughts. And, and they said, we'd rather be reduced to charcoal than tell you what those thoughts are. So they had these like strong doubts. And they didn't tell Rasulullah what they were. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, really you get those thoughts? And they said, yes. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that is Iman. That is Iman. Like that is faith. Why did he call that faith? Why? Because the fact that it troubled them, it means that they love deen. Like I, that was like my defensive mechanism over you're trying, these doubts are trying to invade what is important to me. And that worries me. And I can't let that happen. Stay away from me. So that agitation is a sign that you love faith. So it's not bad. It's actually good. But you've got to address it, right? You've got to address it. You laughed. Or anyway, we'll just leave whatever thought he came into your mind. Let's leave that be. But you get the point. Because you know, by the way, every, those intrusive thoughts are common to everyone here. I guarantee you, every single person in this room has had them. Everyone. I had them. 15, 16 year olds, all those questions. Come in. And then, but that led me on a, on a pathway and on a journey that Allahu Akbar where it led me. But at the moment, at that time, I thought I was doomed. 15, I thought I was doomed. Why? Intrusive thoughts. Where are they? Ya Allah, my daddy, what's going on? What's happening? Intrusive. I thought doom and destruction. That was it. But it's not doom and destruction. It's not doom. And now you reflect back and you think, subhanAllah, the path of how you got the agitation is not bad. Agitation is good. It's good. It leads you somewhere. Young man, Rings me up. He says, he says, my, you know, my son, he said, my, my brother was threatened. I said, is he, is he in immediate? He said, but the risk, the danger's over. But I just, I can't believe that someone threatened him. I said, you're agitated? He said, yes. I said, good. I said, because the last, for the last 10 minutes you've been talking, you haven't mentioned Allah once. You got agitated, but you need to remember when you feel like this, don't ever take Allah out of your response for the last 10 minutes, I said, you're a righteous believer. You never mentioned Allah once in the last 10 minutes. Where is Allah in this? Where is Allah? Where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He'll protect you. He'll guide these things. He'll maneuver these things. He'll push these things. Come back to Him. Seek comfort in that. Don't, it's not just about you resorting to old ways and going back to old ways. and challenge. Often we, we forget. But the agitation, where does it lead to? It leads to a reminder. And then look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he rang me, he telephoned me, I gave him the reminder, and then it, remind, it reminds me every time. This is not a bad thing, inshallah. All right, so before I get into, if there's, did you want to ask something quick? Yep. Yeah, just a quick one. Shaykh, I understand that some people, like, we are created out of Allah's love, but are some things created out of his hate? For example, like, people destined for the hell? No, no, definitely not. Definitely not. We, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you, you can't say, Allah both loved the thing that he hated. It doesn't work that way. And, you know, this question of if he knew I was going to Jahannam, why create me in the first place? I'll answer that question to you. And some of our students might know that answer here because they've been at some of our classes. But I'll give you the answer quickly. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowledge, knowledge does not, knowledge does not equate Right? To hatred or does not equate to. Let me give you by way of example. I'll just explain it this way. So I'm going through a sh sh the, the marketplace and I'm buying a bike for my child. And the child and the, the ca cashier or the person serving me says, Your daughter or your son or whatever is definitely going to fall off that bike. Don't buy that bike. I said, Well, I'm doing a good thing here. I'm doing a good thing. I'm buying a bike because it's going to increase the happiness of my child. Like they, and it's good for them, like riding a bike. It's excellent. No, 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 no. They're going to fall off. I say, you know what? I know they're going to fall off. I know they're going to fall off. But still, buying a bike is good for them. Even though you know? Even though I know. So you have 100% yakin that that's, they're going to fall off and you still buy the bike? Absolutely. Because it's good for them. So I buy the bike. Even though I had knowledge. Knowledge... It doesn't make something an evil. 
even though you know. Knowledge does not equate to evil. Write that down. Knowledge does not equate to evil. Even though I knew, knowing something did not mean that that thing which is good is a bad thing. I knew what I was doing in buying that bike that it was a good thing. My knowledge of it does not equate to evil. So knowledge does not equate to evil. So just because he knows, it doesn't mean that it equates to evil. It's a good thing that it was done. Then the decision then that ended up in an adverse outcome for the individual is based on that individual and what they did. They made the decision. They say, had we thought or used our intelligence, we wouldn't now be among the, the companions of the blazing fire. So they are the ones that are to blame for such circumstances. So you understand the point then when, when we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy and compassion and favor, that, that's where it ensued from, for all of his creation. For all of his creation. And we should never ever forget that. And if harm befalls you, if a calamity befalls upon you, if you lose a loved one, and nobody lost more loved ones than the Prophet Sallallahu right? Or his children, except Fatima six months later, radiallahu anha, he lost his, his wives, he lost his companions, he lost his mum, his dad, his grandfather. You want to talk about loss, he lost. But he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he only ever said what pleased Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as we saw what he said about his son Ibrahim when he said, I become saddened but I'm not going to say anything that goes against, uh, across, uh, uh, against the decree. Only what pleases Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah doesn't, when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he takes you to that cliff, it's not so he can push you off. Allah wants you to see something. Maybe you can only see it in flight because he wants you to fly. Not because he wants you to kill you. So Allah did not, the, the objective was not to drive you away from him. How can it be that he created me out of his love and yet he, he, he does something? It's not to drive me away from him. It's not. It's to drive that connection. But it's a misunderstanding sometimes. Start from a place. This is an, in answer to your question. The house will crumble. The house will crumble. If it's built on weak foundation, what does that mean? The house will crumble if it's built on weak foundation. What does that mean? It means that if I start from a place of suspicion with Allah, you'll never get to a good outcome. The house will crumble if it's not built on a solid foundation. In other words, you ask the question, why did Allah do this? You started from a place of suspicion. Why? You're questioning something from a place of, of doubt as opposed to who is Allah? Who is Allah? They're the loving, the caring, the merciful. And he doesn't do except to make things closer between him and I. If you start there, you build a solid structure because the foundation is set. But if you don't start from that place and you start on weak foundations, what happens? The house will crumble eventually. So you need the correct footing, the sound footing. All right. Are we okay to move on or we have a question? Jibran uh, Muhammad. He beat you to it, Jibran. نعم نعم Allah barik fiq. Allah barik. That's right. May Allah unite us, inshallah. Muhammad. So can you sort of maybe um, just essentially answer this by a complete recap? My apologies, but but in terms of quintessentially, we spoke about the boy who said he to understand, um, you know, what Allah wants from me, but I'm going to choose my own, um, you know, my own way. You know, I'm going to choose, you know, just want to go my own way. Um, and so, so my question is, you know, what is the cause of that spiritual light bulb to turn on? What is, what's, what are the missing ingredients? Is it, so is it a summary of everything that we've discussed? Is it something else? Um, is it the fact that he wasn't, he was missing something specifically that he wasn't asking for his day? What is it that turns on the spiritual light bulb? So what, what led to it and what, what turns it on? And that's a fundamental that's a really, really important question that Muhammad is asking. And what leads to uh, someone who might 
choose to do something, whether it's disobedience or an act of sin, all of the things that we've, we've spoken about today, sometimes that allowing those things to creep in our world, it, it, covers, it covers the heart, covers the fitrah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, every time a person sins, a black dot comes on the heart. What heart is he talking about? Not the physical heart, the spiritual heart. So every time a person sins, a black dot stains the heart until eventually the heart is completely black. Once the heart is black, your, your perspective changes. So there's something about your perspective on the world that changes. And the, the other problem is when you love, when, when, you, when, when the love for all the halal things is equal, including the love of Allah. So some people will say, I love Allah, but the love that I have for Allah is not equal in my heart. I love other things in my heart greater than the love of Allah. So I still love Him, but at the moment, there's something greater than my love for Him. This is where this is this is how it becomes problematic. Your attachment, this is what you're saying, how you got there. The attachment for something else, the love of it, has become greater now. It, it's, it's surpassed the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So your perspective shifts when, when that happens. So A, the futra is clouded. Remember, and, and how do what's the proof that it's clouded? Remember that hadith Muhammad when the Prophet said, every person is born a futra and then his mum and dad make them uh, Jew, Christian, or Magian. So what the Prophet is saying is that there's external forces that can impact the fitrah. Because when the Prophet, every person is born a fitrah, natural faith, and then there's external forces. So that's how a person can potentially get there. And having that love or the even things that you love, halal, that dominate over the love of Allah, you can definitely get there. And that becomes, as Ghazali said, like a poison that has to run its course. Ghazali said, like a poison, has to run its course until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets you out of it. How you get out of it? It's, it's, there are some ways that you can get out of things, some ways that you can get out of things. And, you know, first and foremost, if, if I, example, and I'm going to look at this from every facet. If I'm a parent, and, my, and I am a parent, and I've got seven kids, and let me tell you, they all go through, they all go through, you know, their different phases. You're making hidayah for them. You're saying, Ya Allah, guide them, Ya Allah. I had, there was a father who's in, in our group. And he, he, he gave his uh, son a phone for the first time. I said, you know what? I said, all right. I said, but bring the phone to me first time. Bring it to me before you even give him the phone. He said, all right. So I am, if you ever want to restrict the phone, come to me. Especially if it's an iPhone. I know every nook and cranny in it. So I took this phone, which his kid had seen, and I restricted it. And there's a special passcode for the restriction. It's different to the code that opens the phone. This one is if you try and change anything, you need the code of that restriction to be able to open up the App Store and Google and whatnot. So I restricted this phone and then the, the, the kid looked at it and he said, my phone's a calculator. <laughs> like it's become a calculator. He said, I don't want it anymore. I don't want it. And then, you know, we spoke and we talked and, and it was all about taking away Google. And it was all about taking away certain functions. And mind you, he has access. He's got a laptop. But it was just the phone, the device. Having the device in the hand. And I know this is going to resonate with everyone here. Everyone. Having that device. I've got rules. No devices in rooms. I've got a rule. In my house, when I did my counseling diploma, I remember that the psychologist who was running the course her name was Amanda. I still remember to this day. Not Muslim. She says, I've got a rule in my house. No devices in rooms. SubhanAllah. This, she said, I'm a parent. I still got a parent. Don't talk to me about world current day. I'm a parent. I don't care what current day says. This is how I'm living. I'm, I've, I've got a responsibility. I'm going to execute it. No devices in rooms. That's, 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 that's a very good rule. It's a very excellent rule. So then I restricted this kid's phone. This kid... Google, 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 Google. He, he, he hurt his father's heart. Anyway, we went somewhere and I was talking to this young man. I took him aside and said, listen, let us have a serious conversation. And I'm getting to a point, Muhammad. Wallah, I'm, getting to, I'm not just waffling. I'm getting to a point. What I was saying to this young man was, it's not just about, your father's not trying to do anything to hurt you. Your father loves you. He comes from a good place. And he sees 50 steps ahead. But sometimes we have to take the message. And sometimes we have to learn how to accept no. 
And sometimes it's about in life, you'll get things, you'll get where you'll get. If you were restricted and cut off, we'd say it was, it was somewhat unfair, but you're not. And sometimes you have to just accept that these are my parents and they want the best for me and I have to take their advice. And that's what it's about. That mentoring conversation, that type of conversation that we're having had a big impact on him. And why do I tell you that story? I tell you that story because sometimes we need mentors outside of parents. Sometimes we need mentors outside of sister and brother. Sometimes we need mentors outside of our neighbors. But sometimes they can all be our mentors, right? They can all be our mentors. So we need someone in our world. How do we get out of it? We need somebody along that journey with us. Someone can be a like friend. We need somebody who can advise us on the way. Somebody who has knowledge, who can tell us and guide us along the way. Obviously being the mechanism that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is utilizing. But Ghazali said, okay, when does the light bulb go on? And I've often said this. Sometimes the light bulb can go on through being given the advice. Sometimes it's old age. When a person reaches old age and they say, what did I do? Right? Old age, like the Umar is gone. And sometimes the person goes through it and falls flat on their face, which is unfortunate. And they get hurt. And then they say, I realized now what was being said to me was the right advice, but I didn't take it. But once a person's in it, it's like a poison that runs its course. It's very, very hard to shift or shake that person when the heart has been seized. Remember, your heart is the captain of the ship. The, the body follows where the heart is, not the opposite way around. See your mind? Your mind follows everything. is commanded by the heart. And that's why, وَالَّذِينَ أَمُرُ أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ The hub and the love it dictates, it dictates, you, and, and that forces the body. I don't know if I've answered your question. Anyway, look, there was a couple of hadith I wanted to go over with today, inshallah. I'm, I'm mindful of time, I've got 15 minutes. But there's a couple of hadith that I really just wanted for each and every one of you to take away with today, inshallah, to walk away with, inshallah. And they're so important hadith for us to remember and utilizing our lives and they're practical they're practical some of them are what we do in society and some of them are what we do in our own time but before i tell you i want to tell you this i want to teach and i want to tell you that the society today needs every one of you society needs you you've come here you've you've been given you've receiving we we inshallah the malaika are around us inshallah they, they, there's praise inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this a blessed gathering. But you need to also have your foot in society and you need to be able to affect society in a good way. The Prophet said, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ أَنْفَعَهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ خَيْرُ النَّاسِ أَنْفَعَهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ The Prophet said in the hadith that the best amongst people is the one who benefits them the most. The one who benefits them the most. Someone told me yesterday they wanted to do hijrah. I said, don't do hijrah. They said, why? I said, you do hijrah, you're not of benefit to, the, to, the, to suburbia anymore. And you need to be benefit to suburbia and you're having benefit. You can't make hijrah now. It's a detriment. خَيْرُ النَّاسِ أَنْفَعُهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ It's a hadith. And this hadith, the, the best of people, the best of people are the ones most beneficial to them. So be of benefit to the people. How do you be of benefit to the people? How? In your knowledge. In your helping. In your volunteering. Wallah, I never underestimate a volunteer. Ever. Do it the right way. It's the best thing that you can do. Execute it the right way. The most beneficial for others. You're a guide. You're going to become guides for others. Write a book. Start a revolution. Start a charity. Start a mosque. Start an organization. Don't limit yourself. Be a benefit to others. Look at the opportunity before us. The only thing that will leave us is opportunity. But you have the opportunity. Seize it. Right? You don't know what you don't know. Start something. Do something. Say something. Be in something. If you can't do it, be in it. Assist it. Affect it. Go out of your way. Sacrifice. You know what the glitter of our faith is? The glitter. Glitter stands out. Wallah, if I see just one glitter on, on my daughter or something, you've got a glitter. Come, let me take it out for you. 
Hala might get in your eye. As a concerned parent, don't want to get in your eye. My daughter once got that glitter in her eyes. It literally went in her eyes and we took her to hospital. And I, I had to be the one, because they, they, they tried to put her in one of those jackets. She got out of it. You see, Because they were trying to put a whole water in each eye. I said, you're going to have to hold your daughter down. And I can't hold her down. Like, you got to exert force. I, I can't. How much force do you want me to exert? Because this girl is like that. Anyway, I don't know. This, that was such a deviation, all of, all of our glitter. What is glitter? What is the glitter of our faith? The glitter of our faith is sacrifice. That's it. If there's no sacrifice, it doesn't stand out. People now want din and no sacrifice. <laughs> you want din and no sacrifice. It doesn't work that way. We don't, we're, not, we're not results driven. We're not a results driven ummah. We're not. The Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if. As he went to Ta'if, don't you think that when he went to Ta'if, came back, got pelted by stones and nobody accepted Islam. And he had to seek help from others to get back into Mecca because his uncle Abu Talib had passed away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have told him before he left, Ya Rasulullah, they're not going to accept, leave them alone, stay where you are, it's safer for you. But he didn't tell him. Why? There's a lesson in the sacrifice. There's a lesson in it. What's the lesson in the sacrifice? Nobody accepted Islam. Were we not a results-driven ummah? If nobody accepts, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if nobody accepts. It doesn't matter if I stand out there for 12 hours and nobody thanked me. That's really, I, it's sacrifice. I made the sacrifice. I made the contribution. That's what stands out. That's what Allah accepts. Not results-driven. Anyway, inshallah khair. But you get the point. So be the best benefit as you can to others. Be of benefit. Don't stick to yourself. Don't stay to yourself. Unless something is going to be detrimental for you. If you know that your religion is going to be harmed, then and only then, it's a different story. The other hadith that I wanted to relay is, what, and this is from a really, so let's say that you have benefit to people. You come home, you've spent time with your family as a, as a married person. You spend time with your family, but then you need your own time. Then you, you get your alone time. You're by yourself. There's nobody except you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did the Prophet say? He said, When you're by yourself and you're alone, khalawta, khalwa. See that khalawta, khalwa? It comes from what? When you're alone and there's nobody. This is your alone time relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Move your tongue as much as you can. Now is the time to immerse yourself in the remembrance of Allah when you're alone, when there's nobody there. Either either khalota, in khalwa. So now you're not amongst friends. It's just you. There's a silence. You're sitting by yourself. There's just you and Allah and that silence. And if you don't move your tongue, you're allowed to think. You're allowed to say the dhikr in your mind. That's okay. The tongue is not a condition for dhikr to be accepted. You can use your mind to make the dhikr. But here, the ulama, they say that if you use both the tongue and the mind, this is optimal. This is the best if you use both. Wallah, we need those spaces, my dear respected. It's a debrief for us. It's a, we, we sit back and we just reflect and we contemplate. It's just that personal connection. We debrief. You know, when you fall asleep, what happens is your mind releases everything that happened during that day and you wake up, it's like you're refreshed. The brain needs a restart and it refresh. You know, alone time is like that. When you have personal time with Allah, it's like that. It's like, yeah, Allah, all my stresses, but now they're yours. You carry them. I can't carry them. You carry them. And give them to Him. He'll take care of you. Give them to Him. You leave them to Him. And that's a de-stress, that alone time. وَإِذَا خَلَوْتَ فَحَرِّكْ لِسَانَكَ مَسْتَطَعْتَ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ As much as you can in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is now your alone personal time. This is, these are formulas for us. That on benefit, look, the best of people, those who are benefit to others. And then this one here is, subhanAllah, when I'm alone, I need to, I need to engage him. Right? The other hadith that the Prophet said, he said in, in another hadith, which is very, very important. And this goes to the heart of what we're talking about and that connection. So this is the, to the heart of the connection. He says, Laysa yataharrasa ahlul jannah. That the people of Jannah, nothing. They, they live in felicity, right? So the people of Jannah, inshallah, we're all from there. 
inshallah. Inshallah, we attain Allah's rida. But the people of Jannah, they, they have. ليس يتحرس على الجنة على أهل الجنة إلى على شيء. They don't have this type of regret to a better word, right? But it's not a regret that causes alarm or causes hurt. But the people of Jannah don't have any regret over anything except one thing. إلا على ساعة مرت except over there was a time that it passed مرت بهم لم يذكر الله. There was a time that passed that they could have remembered Allah in, but they chose to do something else. And it was that one moment that, that passed that they did that they regret. Yeah, late, yeah, late any. I wish I could utilize that time to go back and think about and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during that time. Maybe it's during a prayer, maybe it's during a night, maybe it was during a night time where you had that opportunity to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you chose something instead. Maybe you, maybe the day of judgment, even you're in Jannah, right? So you're still in Jannah. But you choose that time, you still, you say to yourself that this is one of my regrets. So how important then is the dhikr of Allah? How much does it elevate a human being? Look how it elevates us. So even in Jannah, subhanAllah, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look, this is the question though. Why is, what is the greatest thing that, you can find in this world the remembrance of Allah. Why is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the greatest thing in this world? Why? Why is it the greatest thing in this world? Because it goes back to that connection with Him. It's all about that connection with Him. And that hadith, it paints that picture very, very well. Another hadith that we were talking about um, and some of the things that, that, we were, that we were hitting on is a hadith that talks about this world. There's two more hadith I'm going to mention, then we're going to finish up, inshallah. Five minutes. Man kanat dunya hammahu. Whoever's world is their greatest worry. In other words, if this world is your greatest worry, your greatest worry, farraq Allahu alayhi amra. The Prophet, وسلم, he says, then Allah scatters his affairs. Their affairs become so scattered. وَجَعَلَ فَقْرَهُ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْ If this world is your greatest worry, Allah scatters your affairs. In other words, your affairs become so divided that you just become worried about everything that you can't maintain anything. They become too much. They become overwhelming. If the dunya is your greatest worry and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He places the fee of poverty between your own eyes. You're so worried about it. It's between you. What does this hadith say? In other words, this world, it's, your, if, if that is your greatest worry, you've misplaced your worry. There's somewhere else you need to place your worry on, upon. Like what? How will I answer the questions? How will I meet Allah? What will He say to me? Won't He see right through me? Every response that I have, won't He know before I even answer what I'm thinking? Aren't I worried if I'm sincere or not? These are the type of things that I should be worried about. How will I be across that sirat? Will I be prevented from drinking from the hand of Rasulullah at the hawl? Will the angels prevent me? Because not everybody will drink from the hands of the Prophet ﷺ at the hawl, at the fountain. Will I be those ones who are prevented? What worries you? Most of you, I, I, I would say, aren't parents, but as parents, I worry about my kids. But I worry about as well how I will leave this world how I'll depart from this world, how it'll be for us. Khalid radiallahu anhu, Khalid, Khalid al-Walid, he said, tabban lil jabban, tabban lil jabban, layta umma Khalid lam talid Khalid. He said, perish be the coward, perish be the coward. Tabban, you know, tabban, tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tabba. Tabbat yada, tabban, he said, tabban, tabban lil jabban. He said, perish be to the coward. He said, later, Umma Khalid, Lam Talid Khalid. He said, I wish the mother of Khalid did not, did not beget Khalid. Why? He said, I never thought I'd die on my deathbed like a, like a beast. He referred to him like a beast dies. You know why? Because Khalid wanted the shahada. He wanted to die as a shaheed. He was, he was known as who? Who was he known as? The sword of Allah. 
one of the scholars they said but Allah would not allow him ever to die why to die on the battlefield because the sword of Allah will never be broken Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah anyone who knows Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah was last story before I finish Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah when he left before he left this world Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah the Prophet sent companions to look for him on the field on the battlefield he was wounded and they came to Sa'ad Sa'ad heard their voices they heard they saw Sa'ad and they said the Prophet sent us to check on your health and to see whether you're from amongst the living and amongst the dead. He said, I'm from amongst the dead. And he only had a few breaths. He was breathing his last breath. Sa'ad uh, ibn Rabi'ah. And then he says, his first thing he says before he dies, how is the Prophet? Is the Prophet safe? How is Rasulullah? Is he safe? And then they said, the Prophet's okay, the Prophet's okay. And then he says to them, he says, Wallah, give my salam to the Prophet. Give my salam. Look, he, he's passing from this world. He says, give the Prophet my salam. Give him my salam. And give, then give my salam to the people. And tell the people that Wallah, on the Day of Judgment, if anything happens to the Prophet, whilst you were here and, and around him and amongst him, you shall have no excuse before Allah on the Day of Judgment. And he died. He passed away. He didn't give a wasiyah to his family. He didn't give a wasiyah to his kids. He didn't give a wasiyah about his wealth. He didn't give a wasiyah to anything. The only concern was Rasulullah. What are we attached to? And so I wanted it to make it fitting that we finish on the words of the Prophet ﷺ. That's why I wanted to finish with this hadith. Very important because they command, they command that we live accordingly. He is the exemplar. How do you think we execute our purpose through the exemplar of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The last hadith that I will quote, and it's the last hadith that I've written here, is Salullah. Ask Allah. Salullah min fadli. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his bounties. Ask Allah from his bounties. Fa inna Allah azza wa jal yuhibbu an yus'al. Allah loves it when you ask. He loves it when you ask. Wa afdalu al-ibadah. Look what Allah subhanahu Look what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says. وَأَفْضَلُ الْعِبَادَةِ انْتِظَارِ الْفَرَجِ انْتِظَارِ الْفَرَجِ What's انْتِظَارِ الْفَرَجِ? The best ibadah is in the waiting. I'm waiting. Some people think that the best thing is I get the outcome. But the best, the Prophet ﷺ said, وَأَفْضَلُ الْعِبَادَةِ The best ibadah, the best form of worship is in the waiting. I'm asking, but I'm waiting. I'm asking, but I'm waiting. It's actually wait. Waiting is ibadah. Waiting is ibadah. And it's the best form of worship. My dear respected brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made our purpose clear. And it begins by, wallah, it begins, that's why I only put some prompt points here. It begins with him. It begins with him. And at the end, look what it ends with. It ends with what is at our core. What is at our core? It begins with him. But now we have some decisions to make. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I know you've, you've sat here for quite a bit and, and the food is here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our journey one that is one of connection and not disconnection. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow our hearts to have that presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within them and not an absence. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us to that which pleases him and keep us away from that which displeases him. We are deficient and we're limited and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all our deficiencies and accept all our limitations and accept all our shortcomings. Ya Allah, we come to you with all our deficiency and you replace it with perfection. Allah, you replace it with, you give value to our deficiencies. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our deficiencies. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our limitations. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us our shortcomings. May He forgive our limitations and may He forgive us our, tra our transgression and may He forgive us our sins and disobedience and may He forgive our Muslim brothers and sisters who passed before us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove the oppressors from this world sooner rather than later. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove the oppressors from this world sooner rather than later and, and, and put, the, put our Muslim brothers and sisters in situations of ease and remove them from the situations of hardships and difficulties and their entrapments and their prisons and their jails, Ya Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbana ghafir lana 
والإخوان الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت تواب رحيم اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه نبيك محمد ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاذ منه نبيك محمد وأنت المستعاذ وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم اللهم اهدنا واهدي بنا وجعلنا سببا لمن اهتدى يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اللهم اهدنا واهد بنا وجعلنا سببا لمن اهتدى يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم كن معنا ولا تكن علينا يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم اتنا في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وقنا عذاب النار واخذ دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين بسر الفاتحه